Greetings, you curiouser and curiouser hurly burlyites. Welcome to the pod. I think today is going to be a really interesting continued conversation. What I mean by continued is this. If you're a regular listener, you may remember our episodes with Labour Ministers McNaughton and O'Regan within the last year. We've got a heavy dose of government's perspective on critical labour issues. Today, the flip side. We'll hear the union perspective on all the key issues with two of our country's most progressive labour leaders, Charlene Stewart and Lana Payne. Ms. Stewart is a friend of this pod, not only because she was raised in the glorious province of Saskatchewan, <laughs> but because she made a pre-pandemic appearance in 2019 as we, presciently as it turns out, talked about vulnerabilities in the long-term care industry. She's the Vice President, International Vice President for the Service Employees International Union and President of SEIU Healthcare. Ms. Payne's roots are from The Rock, Newfoundland. She's the newly elected National President for Uni of Unifor, Canada's largest private sector union, succeeding Jerry Diaz, who was also a guest on the pod in 2019. Today, we're going to dive right into the state of public sector negotiations in Ontario, Bill 124, healthcare privatization, education, playing fast and loose with the notwithstanding clause, all of that kind of stuff. We're going to talk about cost of living issues and inflation. What is Unifor and the CL? What is Unifor stance? What is the union movement stance on the Bank of Canada and its rhetoric and actions uh, in recent months? And generally, the role of today's organized labor in creating good jobs, dealing with gig work, and political advocacy. Charlene and Lana, it is so great to have you here on the Hurley Birdie. Thanks for making the time to join us. It's great Thanks to be back with us. you, David. Yeah, Charlene, how are you? Oh, well, I'm excited. Uh, like you said, very busy, and the show is going to be full of, yeah, lots of good, interesting things to talk about. But mm. Very nice to be back. Great, great to have you back. You look great. Lana, nice to meet you. Thanks for coming on. You too, and great to be here. Okay. And you're in a hotel room, you said. Where do we find you today? I am. I'm in Toronto. I'm at the Sheraton. Our uh, Ontario Regional Council is happening over the coming days, which means locals from all over the province are uh, coming together and uh, not a bad time to be doing that considering uh, what's been happening uh, in the province in the last uh, days and weeks. Absolutely. Are you still ordinarily resident in Newfoundland? I uh, have a home in Newfoundland, but I stay here most of the time, uh, much to my husband's chagrin because uh, he's still working in Newfoundland. So we're like many uh, couples in this country. Uh, we try to commute uh, and we do it the best as we can. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, you know, people from Newfoundland tend to really like to go back to Newfoundland, so we're, as near as I can tell. Yeah. Yes, uh, yeah. I'll be doing that at Christmas time, and I can't wait. Maybe more frequently than Charlene and I get back to Saskatchewan. I don't know, but well, it's a lot colder <laughs> there. You know, you could probably miss the winter months. Yeah, no, that's true. Yes, <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> I've sort of yeah. I, I hear you. So listen, let's let's. The, Right away, there's big news for us to talk about, which is the ruling yesterday by the court in Ontario that Bill 124 violates the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. This is the bill that had capped public sector wage increases, the Ontario Public Service wage increases, at 1%. Um, and uh, the court said, actually, you can, only, you can pay only 1% if you want, but you can't legislate that without having going through a uh, collective bargaining process that collective bargaining is is protected so what are the consequences of this ruling what happens next either one of you jump in okay. well i i just want to say hooray you know this is a big win for workers and david it's a win for workers right across the country i mean we've had two wins recently uh with Doug Ford's unconstitutional behavior. So I want to take a moment to celebrate because the labor movement doesn't have a lot of celebrating to do lately. So, and I'm glad to see the worst sexist, racist uh, bill in history be squashed by the Superior Court. So, and I'm really happy about that. And it's a win for workers. And, you know, the message again from that government to uh, Premier Ford and to any anti worker government, and there seems to be a few of them in our country. You know, keep your hands off our constitutional right. 
So we're happy. We're celebrating. And I just have to say, I talked to some folks. We were at a big rally yesterday uh, telling them to kill Bill 124. And then the announcement came in the afternoon. They were so happy. You know, they said to me, they felt like the days when they were banging the pots and pans together saying, we see you, we respect you, that they felt that yesterday from that superior court decision. So they're celebrating. And now today, uh, we're getting ready to take the next steps. There's a lot to think about. Uh, you know, like arbitration decisions said, those arbitrators said we, we would if we could, but so we're going to be knocking on their door. We've got some language, uh, that says it's got reopeners in it. So we're going to be going back to the employers and saying, hello, uh, we want to come back and renegotiate wages. And, uh, we're going to, from this moment on, bargain like the bill doesn't exist because in our opinion it doesn't and then we're going to hope that Doug Ford stops wasting taxpayers dollars by fighting the people who care for their loved ones let's get back to work Doug Ford let's get together and see if we can't build confidence back in our healthcare system and the public system and uh, negotiate and work to improve the healthcare delivery in this province because it is in a real mess. So put your money there. I'm sure the public agrees with that instead of spending it on lawyers and putting it in their pockets. So hopefully you won't use that. What's sexist and racist about Bill 124? What's sexist and racist about it? Yeah. Well, I mean, it targets the public sector who are predominantly women. You know, the uh, public sector is healthcare. It's community services. It's education. And we know those are predominantly uh, women who take those uh, responsibilities and careers. And in my union, as you know, in healthcare, especially in senior care, long-term care and in home care, uh, there's a lot of racialized women there and a lot of single mothers as well. So definitely targeted at women and very racist when you take a look at the population that affected. Okay. I, I, th- I would add to that, uh, you know, uh, many of the, the workers in these sectors were part of this fight back campaign over the last number of years. And the the victory from the court really, I think, justifies that work that they were doing, not that we wouldn't have been doing it anyway, right, Charlene? I mean, this is the, the reality when you get bad legislation, you don't have a choice but to push back hard against against those kinds of laws. Um, but I think we need to consider for a second as well how this legislation and how public sector and governments can really reinforce or prolong the gender pay gap that we have in the country. When we get legislation like this, it just perpetuates that gap. It sometimes makes it worse. Uh, So instead of, you know, uh, particularly some of the lowest paid uh, workers, as Charlene pointed out, many of them women, many of them racialized women, uh, they, their wages for the last, you know, decade even have been actually falling far behind uh, inflation, which is why you saw that incredible fight back by the education workers, members of CUPE uh, this year. It is the workers everywhere, though, are saying, look, enough is enough. We're falling behind. Corporate profits are at their highest level ever in the history since we started recording and and keeping track of these things. And it's time for workers to to get a piece of of the economy and a piece of the pie here. And in particular, what we've been finding in our union, more disputes this year and last year than at any point of of the last decade uh, in our union. Uh, They're not long disputes. Uh, some are, but by 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 generally they're short in nature, but they're a te- they're a test for the temperature of the of the times and the mood of working people, and that is we're pushing back hard at every single bargaining table where you can and where we can uh, to make sure that workers are making gains in this moment in time where you have a bit of a tightening labor market, and we're able to take advantage of these things, but the public sector is a different place. It is. Uh, it is not dictated necessarily by by those kinds of tightening uh, things in the, that tightening labor market because we always get stuck with some, you know, these bad pieces of legislation. So we have to push back so that real collective bargaining uh, can take place. And, um, you know, I think the next hurdle is likely the government will appeal this to the Supreme Court of Canada, but that's not going to stop any of us from doing what it is that we need to do uh, for our members and for all, all uh, public sector workers right now. You know, it, it may be that when when people think about public sector workers, they don't think about the people that Charlene represents particularly and what they do. They think about somebody that has a white-collar position, 
that earns $100,000 or more, that has complete and utter job security, and a defined benefit pension plan. Um, are those things in this era where those kinds of jobs almost don't exist anymore, is that not worth a little reduction in salary to have that kind of a job? I No. <laughs> no? Our job is to bring everybody else up. <laughs> I, I think the reality is uh, what we've been seeing particularly, by the way, we represent some of those same members uh, in, in long-term care, in, in community services, uh, and, and again, mostly women, mostly racialized workers. Um, what we're seeing in, in across many bargaining tables right now is actually an opportunity to make those kind of improvements for the first time in a long time. We're reactivating COLA clauses in collective agreements. We're getting rid of two-tiering in many, many cases. And, and you know, improvements to pension plans. Most DB pension plans now are doing really, really well, uh, including being over 100% funded. Uh, so there are opportunities here uh, to do some pretty incredible things for working people. But of course, you know, we've got the Bank of Canada with their shenanigans uh, really trying right, to we'll put get a damper on that. <laughs> we'll get to that in a second. Charlene, <laughs> let's talk about the QP fight because it was really obviously quite a stunning thing to watch. And one of the things that seemed remarkable to me was the way the labor movement came together almost monolithically to fight back against uh, against that legislation. Um, there hasn't been that level of unity generally in the movement. What brought everybody together? How did that come about? You know, the simple, simple way to put it is Bill 28 was Bill 124 on steroids. Like the, he did what he did to Bill 128, again, attacking women. And of course, the education workers are predominantly women. Uh, again, it's sexist and racist, Bill 124, Bill 28, and the labor movement. And more importantly, the workers, like the workers showed up, like Lan and I were there, but there was, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of workers that showed up. So they said, we've had enough. The fact that he imposed the collective agreement on them with Bill 124, he said, sure, you can go out and try and negotiate, but you can't go over this amount. There, he wrote up the collective agreement and placed it on them. They had no choice of that. And uh, just the um, two-tiered stuff that was proposed in there, uh, you know, that's something that we certainly don't accept as a two-tiered system for our workers. Everybody should be treated equal, male, female, doesn't matter. So again, that, that's it. And they could see it. You know, he's getting one step bolder, one step uh, meaner and crueler to the frontline workers. So I think people saw that. But if we don't do something about this, he's going to think he can get away with it. And that notwithstanding act, I mean, that just is a continuous uh, slap in the face. So we came together and really it was our workers that said, we've had enough and we want to send a message to him and every premier across this country that what happens to one, we fight for, whether it's an Ontario worker or a Newfoundland worker, we're going to be there for the workers across this country. Yeah, I, to, so to add to that, I, I think, you know, the internal thinking was perhaps it's education workers, it's public sector workers, we can split the public and private sector unions here. And, uh, you know, solidarity is, uh, is something that we talk about, but uh, is hard to achieve. Um, I, I think what happened here it, unintentionally, of course, it, it, is the entire labor movement was brought together. And for us at Unifor, uh, you know, we, we were very clear to the government early uh, when on Monday when this legislation was introduced, the, the Monday that it was introduced, that we could just not abide by it. This wasn't just about education workers. It was also about private sector workers. And if, if one government got away with overriding trade union freedoms with the notwithstanding clause, every government would try it. Uh, I could see this happening in Alberta, in New Brunswick, in Manitoba, in a whole bunch of places uh, where, you know, Saskatchewan, uh, where, we, where we don't necessarily have worker-friendly governments uh, at the moment. And, you know, for us as a movement, it became, if not now, when? If we don't push back hard against this kind of, of unprecedented attack against trade union freedoms, then you might as well roll over and move on. Uh, like there was really no no choice here. And I think there was a sense, particularly around our own members, many of them 
uh, working in auto plants, in energy plants, all of these uh, kind of private sector workplaces where they know their employers have power that, um, you know, if this could be used against education workers, uh, when possibly could it be also used against them? And then there's the whole side of it as well in terms of what Charlene is saying, enough is enough. People have to stand up for these freedoms and for these rights uh, because if you don't defend them, they will disappear. That's the reality of it. And I think that there were many elements of this bill that were offensive to working people, not just the imposed collective agreement, the fines uh, designed to basically crush the workers and their union, and then, of course, uh, the notwithstanding clause and, and basically uh, overriding people's right to strike. Uh, and, I, you know, once you, uh, once you have uh, auto workers uh, sending a letter uh, to, the, to the government saying, uh, we're with these education workers, and um, I was really proud of our national executive board, uh, they, uh, they voted to say whatever we've got to do here uh, to support these education workers. But that is, what was, law. that is what was so remarkable about it, because the labor movement in Ontario has seemed very divided in recent years along public sector, private sector uh, lines. What is the difference in the way public sector unions view the Ford government from the way private sector unions view the Ford government? Charlene, what does Joe Mancinelli see in the Ford government that you don't? <laughs> you want me to speak up for Joe? No. <laughs> Good, no, you Good are asking for Charlene. Joe. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> I hope Joe's listening. <laughs> uh, you know, what I see uh, when I look at the Premier's, you know, um, reactions and relationships with public versus uh, uh, private, I look at his relationship with me, you know, a leader of the uh, public sector workers and a public sector union. Um, you know, I think just things that we've watched and, you know, you said that Minister McNaughton uh, was on your show and, when I hear stuff like him talking about and, you know, showers, that he stands up for those who take showers. And at the end of the day. At the end of the day. Yes, that's true. At yeah. the end of the day. Um, you know, when statements like that come out, first of all, after I try and figure it out, I'm laughing. I'm like, okay, so who does that mean? You know, I mean, uh with, does he is he talking about an OR nurse that you know goes into operating rooms how many times a day and bathes and showers how many times a day after that the things that she has her hands in and that she's cleaning up or you know David like you said we've had many conversations about those who work in long term care you know the things that they are cleaning up you know on an hourly basis you talk about home care workers who go into homes that you know sometimes you can't even get in the front door because of the conditions in there and, you know, and the infections that they're working around. I mean, they take showers, you know, three and four times a day. Um, I just think that a statement like that from, you know, uh, Ford's government is just saying again, that we support men, we support men in hard hats. And that is the private sector. You don't hear him talk too much about, you know, the women who are in scrubs and stethoscopes who take showers at the beginning of the day, showers many times during the day and, you know, to wash themselves at the end of the day so they're not bringing infections into their uh, family's home. So it's it's things like that that I say. And I've reached out so many times to the premier to you know, talk to him about what's going on in the public sector. And he, you know, has not returned my call. And again, I'd say. Actions like Bill 124 and Bill 28 are definitely targeted at women. So the private sector tends to be more male dominated, whereas the public sector is more female. And, you know, and again, Lana mentioned the pay equity, you know, bills that he's uh, has such fancy titles to when you dig right into them. He uses one act to, you know, uh, override and take away privileges and pay equity in that act, too. So it's the actions that Doug Ford has done that points to me the differences in how he feels for private sector and public sector workers. You can't stop progress. We hear that old saw bent out of shape and generalized upon all too frequently. But having professional experience with this sort of thing, I'm telling you that progress can be delayed unnecessarily, often to our detriment. I've been talking for a few weeks now on behalf of our presenting sponsor, TELUS, 
about how it's going to be impossible to meet our climate goals, getting to net zero by 2050, unless we start thinking about digital policy as a huge contributive piece to our climate action plan. Put more pithily, that digital policy is climate policy. TELUS believes that until we come to grips with that mode of thinking and what digital tools can do in the fight against climate change, we are putting in jeopardy the progress we need to make in that fight. The progress Canada signed on the bottom line for. I've mentioned here how universal high-speed connectivity and 5G technologies will cut our greenhouse gas emissions by up to 20%, 40 to 60% of our Paris commitments. We know it because we're all living it, doing more working, learning, meeting, reading, shopping, taking medical appointments, and so on, online. But here's another less obvious sustainability benefit that comes from 5G innovation. There will be an immediate improvement in how we dispose of garbage, hurly burlyites, Our waste management practices, 5G-enabled smart labeling and packaging, is going to seriously upgrade how we sort and divert our recyclables away from landfills. On top of that, it'll help reduce food waste, moving what does get spoiled away from landfills to alternative destinations like energy recovery. Those are just a couple of examples from the very usable, climate-protecting future. But it depends on getting the foundational digital planning and policy implementation right now, so that ultimately we can reach our climate targets. To learn more about this kind of thinking, and to support it, Go to telus.com slash digital policy for climate. Okay. Lana, you kind of straddle both the public and the private sector. Yes, and I do. How do, you, <laughs> how, how do you draw that line with the, with the Ford government? I'll t- I mean, yeah. I'll just give you an anecdote. Okay. So uh, when I was Kathleen Wynne's campaign manager, I would occasionally go and do speeches at private sector unions that were supportive of the government at their conferences and things. And I could tell that while the leadership of those unions was supportive of the government, that the members were not. I could tell when I was speaking to them. I could tell from the Q&A sessions that these guys in the room didn't like, uh, weren't going to vote the way that their uh, leadership wanted them wanted them to vote. And, you know, the polling indicates that young and middle-aged men are leading very heavily conservative these days. How does that affect the political positions that the uh, that the union takes. Yeah, well, we're we're not actually tied to any political party. Uh, we we try to make sure that we elect. Uh, I think Charlene's union is like that too, uh, not necessarily affiliated. But the, so the challenge always is how do we do what we need to do at the bargaining table uh, with employers uh, for our members, and then politically, how do we get things done for our members? And for us, we have to do it in two ways. Uh, Yes, in some ways, the government is the quasi-employer, if we're talking about long-term care homes uh, or or hospitals. Uh, And then we have the large bulk of our membership who are, you know, working in manufacturing and auto and energy and all of these other sectors of the economy. And, And we need the government to be responding to the things that need to happen in those sectors. So for me... I have to be able to have a conversation with the premier about both these worlds. And, and I don't shy away from doing that. I can't. My job and my chief job is to represent working people. And that's what I need to do every single day. So having a conversation with the premier about the fact that they need to do something with the Thunder Bay facility where we should be building subway cars and all of the things that we should be manufacturing in Canada, making sure that they're there to invest in the auto industry and be part of this new EV uh, transformation that's occurring. Those are conversations that still have to go on. And at the same time, I'm saying to him, okay, you're doing good work here, but over here on the healthcare file, we got a lot more to do, Premier, and here's why. And making the exact same arguments that Charlene has been making around who's impacted, what we need to do to support healthcare and education. We have education members as well. So it's about making sure that I'm representing all of our members. And I think, uh, I think we do a decent job of that. But Lana, let me just stick with you for a second. What happened in the last provincial election in Ontario makes it very, it's confusing for a voter. How is a voter to decide um, which parties in the interest of working people when you've got, half the union movement supporting the conservatives and the other half supporting the NDP. 
Well, I think, you know, people make up their mind about candidates for all kinds of reasons and politics, not just because of the role that unions play. I mean, they're exposed to all kinds of of information. What I'm in, saying is these private sector unions are undercutting you. They're undercutting you politically, right? Well, they get, they get to make their own decisions too. It's, they're not, you know what I mean? I don't get to dictate to them what they do. Uh, we have to do what we have to do as a union and we do it well. Uh, what I would say is that there are in, in many cases uh, a need uh, for, for unions to have good conversations with their members about politics and about um, you know, who's in favor of what and who's supporting what and, and not just dictate and preach uh, to our membership. These are, these are, these need to be what I would call fulsome conversations. We, we are way past the time when we can just say, okay, vote a certain way or do something. Our, our members expect more than that. And I, I believe they, they deserve more than that from us. Okay. Charlene, I want to just take a little detour with you for a second off of this track because it's so on my mind and I've got you here. During the pandemic, if there was one thing that everybody agreed on, it was that the situation in our long-term care homes was a disgrace and needed to change. Your members are on the, and you have some too, Lana, but Charlene, your members are on the front line of this. What is happening on that front? Is anything good happening? Is there some change like... Are, are, is there improvements in the level of care and then the quality of these homes going on? No, unfortunately, David, there's not. And, you know, the sad thing is, and I said it so many times, and, you know, the three years of the pandemic is kind of blurred. So I try to think which wave was it, what year was it. But when they started to lift some of the restrictions and, you know, uh, all of us were working in our house. And, you know, I would sit there day after day after day and see my neighbors and talk to uh, talk to them across the fence. And, you know, all that the public and the people of Ontario wanted to do was get back to normal. Like they wanted to have their barbecues in their backyards. They wanted to have their Sunday dinners. But in the lives of those frontline workers in those homes was so totally, totally different. You know, so I think in times they might have, you know, uh, lifted the restrictions too soon and, and then the infections happened again. But... It is not good. Like there still is COVID in those homes, you know, and the problem is, is that we were fatigued with COVID with not seeing with the isolations and stuff. And we just all want to get back to what was there pre-2019. But it is still there. And those workers are still short-staffed, worse than the early days of the pandemic. The um, uh, conditions of work in there are still deplorable the thing that has changed david is people stop talking about it you mm. know and i mean i continue yeah. to do it you know lana continues to do it but the message to the public is and unless you have a family member in there you don't know like it's something that people just don't want to see but again worse staffing uh, levels than what was in there before uh, more injury there was physical injuries because of the staffing uh, issues mental health Issues are at the highest level that we've seen. Uh, and those who, who did contract COVID, the long haul effects of it, you see some of these people who are still struggling. They can't do their pre-COVID job, even though they're there. Sadly enough, they can't even um, not work because of the low wages that they are faced with. So, no. And unfortunately, the thing that has not changed to is the drive for profits in that sector. You know, and when you see the premier be giving, you know, 35, excuse me, 35 year contracts to the worst performing home care uh, in agency in Ontario, you just got to say, what the heck? Right. How much do your members make? If you're working at a long-term care home, what's your annual salary? That it's averages around $33,000. 33. Yeah, thirty-three thousand dollars annually. So, what community do those people live in? It isn't Toronto. No, absolutely not. And you add on that right now is the inflation. No, absolutely not. Uh, some of them are well. Again, you know, this has really been triggering me lately. Talking about inflation and you know, talking to the federal government about you know their commitment to the twenty-five dollar minimum wage. Uh, the average PSW, as I said, thirty-three thousand, thirty-eight thousand, with the inflation rate that it is, with mortgage rate. It's the way they are. They are being driven out of the homes that they are in in Toronto because, you know, that's landlords are driving them out so that they can increase the um, 
uh, rent. And some of them today are living in their cars with their children. I mean, that is not a lie. They call us and say, I'm in my car. I need help. So unless they have a family member that can bunk them up into the multifamilies, that's the condition that they are working and living in. That's unbelievable. That's unbelievable. We it, had, we had, someone I, should thought, be I asking, thought that there was, I thought that there was a moment of recognition in the pandemic about care workers, about workers in the care sector and about the essential role that they did play and that they were underpaid and that they were treated badly. Does that spirit not exist anymore? That 2020 spirit, is that gone? No, it's not. And like I said, David, yesterday we were at the Sunnybrook rally and that's what they're saying. Like they just feel so disrespected. And they're saying, like, look what I risked for the people of Ontario, for this premier who would say, you know, that he cares about them and that he would go to the bank and give them the money. Well, come on. I mean, you've got your surplus in your um, health spending. Start using it on these folks. They're driving them away. And then, again, to go back to Bill 124, to hear that he's going to appeal that or possibly use the notwithstanding, he's attacking the people who care for the people that we care for and love. And we're faced with the worst consequence imaginable is they are leaving. Nurses are going to the states just across the border to Buffalo to get paid more and get the benefits that they deserve. So we are like, worse off than pre-pandemic and in the early years and months of the pandemic. So it's, they, they, they're not caring for those ones who care for the ones that we love. So first, I want to note that the sun has again been shining on the West Coast and that our sponsor, CN, has been moving grain from the prairies to market at a hell of a clip. The week ending November 20th, in fact, was the railway's second best week ever for grain, 795,000 tons. For the moment, at least, all the cogs in the grain supply chain, and you will forgive my mixed metaphor, are humming along in harmony and precision. But I also want to look east for a moment, to Thunder Bay, up on the northwestern shore of the lakehead. Thunder Bay is to the Great Lakes what Vancouver and Los Angeles are to the Pacific, a crucial gateway. This is inside railroad, so to speak, but CN has been urging shippers for some time now to consider eastern ports as a hedge against the overburdened port of Vancouver, which these days suffers some periodically extreme weather. Atmospheric rivers are savage disruptors. Anyway, as CBC noted on its news website last week, Thunder Bay saw more than a million tons of Canadian potash move through its terminal this past summer. That's more than double the volume of a year earlier. Potash is not as legendary a Canadian crop as grain, but it is ever important. The agriculture industry worldwide uses it as fertilizer. Millions of farmers everywhere depend on it. And Saskatchewan has the largest known potash reserves on Earth. The other big producers are Russia and Russia's close ally Belarus. And right now, and for the foreseeable future, sanctions over the invasion of Ukraine are severely restricting those two countries from selling much potash. So the burden of supplying the world falls to Canadian producers, and those producers have chosen to ship their potash through Thunder Bay. Why? Because Thunder Bay is the only port on the St. Lawrence Seaway that has the facilities to handle potash, and because Vancouver, which can also handle it, is congested. It's pretty much that simple and makes perfect sense. For CN, this is the world aligning as it should. Sensible shipping decisions, methodical forecasting and planning, cooperation along the length of the supply chain, and the railway's push to ensure cargo leaves and arrives on time all add up to record performances. Cargo has to move. And boy, has potash moved. So, Lana, Bank of Canada. (laughs) The Bank of Canada. Um... Unusual, I think, for Unifor to have a point of view about the Bank of Canada. What is the Unifor's view about the Bank of Canada recently? Yeah, I have Unifor and I have views on all kinds of things that might be unusual. That's okay. That's what that's what we do. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I think we're in a, a really uh, kind of challenging uh, moment in the country. Um, we have a high inflation uh, that is uh, causing a, you know, a bit of an affordability crisis, but obviously we had an affordability crisis, especially for a lot of these workers and families that we've been talking about today uh, prior, to, to, uh, prior to this situation. And, and now um, all of this is being made worse uh, by uh, these rapidly rising uh, interest rates. And I think what's different right now 
uh, with inflation than it was, for example, in the 1970s, is what's causing inflation. So it's not workers' wages that are causing inflation. It's things like, you know, high energy prices, a war in the Ukraine, broken supply chains, all of these things that are really outside of an interest rate uh, kind of control situation. And really what's happening now at the Bank of Canada is they're hell-bent on uh, basically sending the country into a recession. And if you look at domestic purchasing power in the last year, uh, we're actually starting to see a decline there. So the reality is we're probably already at the beginning uh, of a recession right now, and, and inflation is, is still where it is. So there needs to be a different solution. We need to get creative about these things. The government has to look at what else can be done to support people who are impacted by inflation. And there are any number of things that can happen there. You can do targeted supports. You can introduce uh, some good programs that, that help all working families, whether it's dental care or pharma care. Uh, and we can start uh, curbing some of these uh, massive profits that we've got going on in our economy. In the last two years, by the way, uh, a full 20% of GDP in the country went to corporate profits. It, that is a, a significantly historic high. Five years prior to the pandemic, the average was 15%. We actually had one quarter of this year where, where a full 25% of the GDP was going to corporate profits. This is, this is not sustainable. I, we cannot carry on where that much of our economy is going to corporate profits and not getting shared and not getting redistributed. And at the same time, we have governments doing massive tax cuts so that we're, you know, starving health care and education of the funds that they need. And these are the programs that are the great equalizer in our country. These are the things that help all working families. And yeah. um, we're going to keep uh, targeting uh, the Bank of Canada for what they're doing because we think that they've got to stop. They have to, they had not just slow down, but stop with this, look at what's really happening in the economy and uh, stop thinking that the solution to the problem is to throw people out of work because that's just going to make inflation worse for those families. Okay, let me be precise about this. Are you disagreeing with what they're doing because you think it's unfair to people or because you don't think it will work to reduce inflation? Can I say both? Because okay. it's both. <laughs> well, let's talk about the inflation side of it just a little bit then. Because, listen, I have to preface this by saying I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about, okay? Uh, <laughs> you I, got to some economists like I do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was not a particular standout, Charlene, in my Economics 100 class at the University <laughs> of Regina. So somewhere around indifference curves, they lost me and never got me back. So... I don't know what I'm talking about, but it seems to me from what I read that I could agree with you 100% that wages have nothing to do with the cause of inflation in Canada and that much of it was initially, if not all of it, was initially internationally driven by supply chains and energy. Um, laterally, the bank says it's been seeing inflation in Canada, but let's say it's not wage inflation. But if workers across the country were to start getting 7 8 9% wage increases, because that's the current rate of inflation, then it's pretty hard for me to see why that wouldn't trigger another round of inflation. Well, I think what you're seeing is that wage increases are about 5% in the last year on average, uh, compared to whatever it is, 7.5% for inflation. So they're not, they're not, they're, they're, workers are still lagging inflation. And prior to this as well, uh, David, we had a situation where about 30 years or so workers were not keeping pace with inflation. So real wages were not keeping pace. We, we are behind. And then we have the situation, which, by the way, where I see the best growth for working people are those at the bottom right now, especially in the private sector. We have been able to deliver really good wage settlements and collective agreements for these folks, whether they're cleaners, whether they're casino workers, whether they're folks who were previously in precarious situations, precarious occupations, and lifting them up. And this is what you want to be able to do in a tightening labor market is lift up the folks at the bottom. So, Charlene, you can feel free to jump in here yeah, anytime, by the way, too. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, the other thing you talk about, you know, not not passing economics 
courses, I, I'm the same way. Uh, but imagine, again, my members. This is so confusing to them. And they're just saying, they're just, everybody's coming after me. And Lana, our, my members would love to have 5%. I mean, we're still trying to get them over the 1.9% today, right today. So yeah, that would be lovely to see that. But when I'm talking to my members at that low uh, income, they just see these big institutions, you know, the Bank of Canada, not collecting data that's important to them. Like we talk about, you know, the markets and all of that. That's who they're using their judgment, the CEOs, the profits, the shares, all of that. But, you know, some of the data that has to be included in these decisions is the impact that it's going to have on you know, a very good and big portion of our country. And that is my members who are losing trust in everybody. So, these institutions aren't using the data. They, they're not realizing the, the, how the struggles that this imposes on the majority of my members when they make these decisions. I mean, all they can see is, you know, they, they're having one meal a day because they can't afford three. You know, that, that all has the domino effect on everything, including the kind of uh, work that they can provide under those kinds of physical conditions. So they're losing food trust in everybody. Food insecurity is shooting up in this country. Yeah. Yes. Right? I mean, look yeah. at what the food banks, have, the Food Banks of Canada uh, group has been saying lately. It's just incredible. One in five working people uh, using food banks right now. And I, I, I mean, I think we should really think about what the governor of the I'll give you. I'll give you a stat that, I'll give you, a, I'll give you another stat though. That's even a little bit more alarming because we've all been hearing about the surge in food bank usage. <clears throat> you know that only 30% or so of the people that are food insecure in Canada ever find their way to a food bank. Yeah. So as busy as the food banks are, they're not even servicing a, they're servicing a fraction of the people that need help out there. Um, so that's just a, that's the tip of the iceberg. Well, and leading David, indicator. imagine how many kids are going to school hungry. Yeah. Breakfast, you know, it's, yeah. It's unbelievable. So I'm a I'm a focus group moderator by profession, and that means that I'm trained to listen for what people think and mean, despite what they actually say. So if I was going to apply that hat to the two of you right now, I would say that you are prepared to tolerate a little bit of inflation in order to avoid a recession. Is that correct? Yes. 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 All right. Yeah. Okay. And do the things that we have to do to help those who can't tolerate the inflation, which is their wages need to come up. They need to have, you know, either targeted supports from, from the government, both all, at all levels. There are things that we can tackle here uh, to make sure that people are not being hurt, while at the same time not, uh, not throwing the country into a, a massive economic slowdown and, and recession, where potentially if they were to go to try to reach their 2% target, which is what the, the bank of the governor of the Bank of Canada says. I mean, this arbitrary 2% target that these central bankers, you know, sit in their ivory tower and try and figure out what it is we're going to do here to, 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 you know, justify our existence. Um, but, but the reality is you, you could be upwards of a million jobs being lost with that, with that kind of uh, impact. It, it's very serious business right now. And, uh, and I think that there are all kinds of ways to solve this problem without doing what they're doing. Well, and if everybody is sacrificing and contributing to an, and avoiding, avoiding a recession, then it should happen at both ends of our uh, financial spectrum. You know, the 1% should be maybe not making so much in their shares and profits. You know, we always start at the workers, at the ones that turn our wheel in economy and businesses. Well, and I think there should be some recognition here too, Charlene, that, you know, during the pandemic, particularly the federal government, but all governments in some ways had everybody's back and including corporate Canada's back, I might add. They were supported uh, through queues and through a whole bunch of other uh, programs uh, to, to get through the pandemic. And for the last, particularly in 2020 and then 2021, and now 2022, we're seeing their profits uh, for most sectors, whether it's oil and gas, whether it's pharmaceuticals. Let's not even get to the grocery store barons and what they've been doing. Uh, but their, their profits are skyrocketing right now. And you can't blame it all on, uh, on the fact that uh, they've, had, they've got to put up prices because of broken supply chains. Because that would mean their profits would go down if they were well, I assume that part bit. of it. I assume that part of it is because they eliminated the emergency pay that they had provided their frontline 
workers yeah. during COVID and reduce them back to whatever they were making before. And I presume part of it comes from fixing the price of bread, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> or whatever, whatever else is being yeah. fixed right now. Uh, but else. the reality is it's, it's time. They've got to give back too. If we're in this kind of a unique moment, uh, everybody's got to come to the table with something and we can't be allowing the people who are earning the least and working the hardest uh, to be the ones that are hurt the most uh, by yeah. this crisis. Yeah. Okay. So let's take the issues you're raising and blow them up to the biggest extent possible, because here's two facts. One fact is that the modern economy tr- creates a tremendous amount of wealth. Canada is a richer country than it's ever, ever been in its history, right? The other fact is that it is distributing less and less of that to working people, the economy. The number of private sector workers in unions is at historic lows. What is the relationship between these things? Well, I think that the challenge for what has happened to unionization rates is is very clear. We went through a period of, um, you know, probably thirty plus years in which laws were make were made very difficult for unionization. We're only seeing some improvements in some provinces and at the federal level uh, as of late. You will recall the Harper era when there was a full on attack uh, against unions, and when you're in that kind of fighting mode, when you're trying to protect what you have, it becomes very difficult to then expand. And I would argue that that becomes part of the strategy uh, by by many right-wing governments is to make it really tough on unions. And when you're in that tough environment, it's hard to organize. Uh, Unlike now, what we're seeing is actually a bit of an organizing moment. And some of that is worker frustration. It is you know, the anxiety coming out of the pandemic. It is all of these folks who feel that they have not been treated well by their employers because in many cases they have not been. And they're reading the business pages too and seeing who's doing well in this moment and who isn't. Um, but, but what has gone on with private sector unionization is a very big story and I think is a podcast all in its own. Uh, because it is related to a lot of factors over over many decades of what's been happening, including you know deregulating labor markets, doing all kinds of things uh, to make it uh, tougher uh, for for unions to do the work that they need to do. And we'll be back after a word from our sponsor, Google. What's the latest news? Beluga whales migrate to the Hudson by the thousands of Ukraine refugees have come to Canada. Housing prices slow down for the first time to turn those clocks back to a new normal as people roll up sleeves for the bivalent vaccines for monkeypox available in some provinces looking to expand use of electric vehicle identified in a hidden runoff from heavy rain is affecting travel is opening up again across the country. Google connecting you to all that's news. When you have a moment where you're not fighting fires. <clears throat> and you have a moment to reflect on what kind of change you'd like to see in the way our economy works that would really make a, a significant change in your members' lives. What do you think about? How do you, outside of governments actually putting in um, proper labor standards or employment standards to lift people up, which, by the way, there isn't one labor code across this country that I would call a decent labor code in terms of shift scheduling, trying to reduce part-time work, having a decent minimum wage, those sorts of things that should be... We tried in 2018. We really did. I know you did. And (laughs) by the way, it was good. Yeah. And it and it would have it would have enabled the labor movement to take this and spread it across the country. <laughs> this is what we do when we get one good law. Oh, but, if I we mean, could turn back the clock. The, I think the other the other side of get that a better too, campaign manager. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, perhaps I'll lend you mine. <laughs> oh, yes, yay. Uh, um, so I, but I do think that that this is uh, and part of what Unifor will be pushing big time in in you know as we as we go go into the future is what does that code have to look like? How do we make gains? I mean, they've done some good improvements in BC. I know this and. Uh, you know, there are things there that we need to export to the rest of the country. But the reality is for a lot of these workers, 
they are in a sector, often in sectors where there isn't large union density. And it's very difficult to organize there because of the precarity of the work, because of the constant turnover of working people. All of those things are true. There is a way that we could do something there. Uh, California just introduced a, a bill on sectoral bargaining for, for workers in, uh, in retail and, and those sectors. This is something that we could do. And I think maybe that code was looking at a, a pilot project on some of those things. But there is a way that we can do this, especially if governments are not going to improve labor codes to the extent that they need to be. We have to give collective bargaining power to working people. It's the only way that the wealth is going to get shared. I, I 100% I agree with that. Um, my question to you as people that understand the nuts and bolts of organization, which most people do not, is, is it possible to organize the modern workforce? Yes, I believe it yes. is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Geek workers, you could organize Absolutely. Uber drivers and Uber Eats delivery people. Mm -hmm. And the, yeah. the thing is, is that they do need a piece of legislation, though, to support that organizing. And that is that they get collective bargaining rights under under the law. And right now, if you're not, it is very challenging to be able to do that. So for, I come from Newfoundland and Labrador, as everybody knows. And in the 1970s, there was a piece of legislation that supported workers in the fishing industry. It was called the Fishing Industry Collective Bargaining Act. And it enabled and empowered, by the way, most of them independent contractors, owners of fishing vessels, to be able to bargain collectively with the people who buy their product. I was going to say, don't you need to fight this notion of contract work versus em work versus employment work? So many people are characterized as contractors that seem to me to be actual employees. Like if you deliver pizza for Pizza Pizza, and that's your job, you hang around waiting for pizzas and you deliver them, they classify you as an independent contractor, not an employee, but you're not a contractor. Well, there's two things here. There are uh, the misclassification of workers, which is occurring kind of everywhere now. We've even got it in the healthcare sector where, you know, they're using temp agencies to bring people in to work right alongside folks who are full full time employed uh, by the hospital or, or the nursing home. Um, and then there's the idea that we will have uh, independent contractors who also can have collective bargaining rights. We represent truckers in the port of Vancouver. They are independent contractors, but they have collective bargaining rights and they're able to bargain wages and benefits uh, with, with the port authority and uh, whoever else is deemed as the employer. So two things need to happen. We need to make sure that workers are properly classified as employees where they are truly employees. And in the case where they're not and they are uh, riding this fence of being an independent contractor, they need collective bargaining rights. Yeah. And you, you could say the same thing about home care. They can be certainly looked at as independent contractors. There's a lot of them in uh, our union down in the States, as you know, David, like we represent 2 million workers in North America. So we have a lot of that happening uh, south of the border that I'm trying to keep back there, not letting it come up to our great Canada. But uh, yeah, we had more calls over the last number of years and through the pandemic from workers wanting to organize because really it, who's going to be their voice if not? Like, look, at we've talked about, you know, the economy and bills and everything else that they're up against. So uh, truth to power. Some of them can't speaking truth to power and the unions will do that for them. But we need, as Lana said, is, you know, stopping governments like the Ford government from tying our hands with bills and using the notwithstanding act. I mean, when you're saying stuff like that, and quite frankly, the more he does that, the more he fires up workers to become unionized. So it's not working. It is completely backfiring on him. And we showed that with Bill 28. This whole conversation is... It's a, it's a funny is, thing I, how bad yeah. employers often are the, are the best for the labor <laughs> 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 um, this whole conversation is 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 predicated upon the uh, sort of I guess age old assumption that this is an adversarial relationship. And I had the ambassador from Germany on my show, and just as an aside, mm -hmm. we started talking about labor relations in Germany, where they have a higher standard of living for most of their working people than we have in Canada, and she described a situation in which. Um, that was much more collaborative 
where unions were much more integrated into the operations of companies sitting on boards, privy to all the financial information. So they knew what the realities of the business were. That wasn't a black box to them. And the, the company saw the, saw the employees and the, and the union as a partner in the enterprise rather than an adversary in the enterprise. That makes so much sense, unless there's something wrong with it. Why wouldn't we do more of that here? 100%. Yeah. Agree. Uh, and, you know, in Saskatchewan, I used to do that. You know, we used to call it interest-based relationships because we both have interests in the outcome of whatever the issue is we're working together on. Uh, yeah, that has that has definitely changed. And, you know, David, there are still employers out there. And again, I'm going to use Bill 124. That was as hard on some of the employers as it was on the workers. We had employers who were willing to give these workers yes. 3% increases. And who stopped it? Like the Treasury Board said, no, we are tearing this up. You go back and you take away what you gave them. That affected their business. Those employers knew that. That affected the uh, uh, care that they were given their residents. So it's almost like it's encouraged by politicians like Premier Ford. Let's be adversarial. Let's not do what's in the best interest of whatever your service is and the people of Ontario. So, you know, these these what we call bad players in the sector, and it starts with the premier. But I truly believe I'm always an optimistic person. Um, we will work with anybody, and it doesn't matter what employer it is. It doesn't matter what political party it is. You know, like Lana said earlier, our interest is in improving the lives of our workers, which I will never uh, disagree with. That it, that will have a positive income uh, out, outcome on care and our economy. So, thanks, Lana. You're in the car business. Do you have any thoughts on what I said? Yeah. Uh, well, well, it's interesting, you know, around uh, adversarial. Uh, I've, I've been in auto bargaining and, you know, these are mature collective agreements. And that means there's mature relationships uh, with with the employer and the union. And it's very professional the way the bargaining is done. Um, it's not always the case that, you know, in other sectors where there may be challenges. I mean, energy is a tough spot uh, uh, when you're when you're up against Exxon Mobil or somebody like that. It's uh, it, can, it can be a different uh, a different kettle of fish. Um, I think the German model is interesting from the perspective that they do try to have a more kind of mature relationship. And but that doesn't mean that all of these other supportive things are not happening. You have a government you know, that's doing uh, good things. They have good labor standards. They have all of these things that, that support what I would call uh, a, a more of a collaborative approach. Canada would have to go a long way before we could uh, get, get to that point. Um, and interestingly, uh, sometimes when some of these German companies are operating somewhere else, they don't employ uh, the same, the same uh, standards. Yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. it, it really, uh, you know, it's not helpful that they're mm -hmm. not, exporting those practices when employers are coming uh, to, to, to other parts of the world. Charlene, I have a recent survey that says that 80% of Canadians think that the minimum wage should be an amount of money that a person could live and raise a family on. 80% of Canadians think that's what the minimum wage should be. What would that be? To me right now, it would have to be $20 at the minimum. In Ontario, especially. Yeah. In Toronto, that does, that even, in that, Toronto does that even get you there in Toronto? No. No. And that means two people working full time. Uh, and uh, Toronto is, an, is a problem all in and of itself. Because uh, I don't know how anybody affords to live in the city. It's, yeah. it's quite something. And but Vancouver, I'm really worried uh, about a city where the people, none of the people who service the people who live there, live there. Correct. Where all of your teachers, firefighters, police officers, hotel workers, restaurant employees, all come in from somewhere else to service you in your city. I mean, this feels dystopian to me. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, David, we've asked for a minimum wage for our workers, minimum, in the Toronto GTA area of at least $25 in the gta and you know and yeah. again universal it should be right across and so 25 dollars that we're hanging on and trying to get from people who committed to that for sure uh one of the things we're arguing too is in some of these large workplaces david like for example pearson airport 
which employs like 50,000 people that go to work there every day, some of them for airlines, some of them for the GTAA, some of them for, you know, contractors, and the the massive problem at airports with contract flipping, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And it's just a matter of kind of undercutting workers' wages. It uh, it results in deunionization, all kinds of problems. So one of the things we've said to the federal government is... Thank God nobody's um, noticed that in service quality or in the motivation of the workers out there. It's good that that's had no impact. Well, I know you say yeah. facetiously, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, this is the, the reality is when you have big places like that, you, once you start putting a few rules in place around, you know, you've got to pay a living wage. This is one of our, our, our goals and campaigns too. a living wage at an airport minimum. That's 50,000 workers that are going to be at living wage or higher uh, in that, in that facility. And then they're competing with other employers. And so now all of a sudden, those employers are going to have to do something to compete for good workers. And uh, I don't think anybody wants to be in the Air Canada situation where after the pandemic, all of a sudden, uh, you know, because you laid off all your workers, you've got nobody left. And this is what's going to be interesting uh, for this recession, if we have one uh, in, in 2023. I hope we don't. Uh, but it's all pointing towards that, is what are employers going to do in a tightening labor market to keep employees? Are they going to do what they traditionally did, which is lay people off? Or are they going to find a way to weather this storm and keep the labor force that they have? And I think that this is going to be really uh, interesting to to watch and see. Okay. Okay. My last question. Um, this has I'll been be so much fun. I'll be to keep them. <laughs> I could just keep rolling and rolling with this, but apparently we try to keep these things to about an hour, and I think I promised you I'd keep it to about an hour. So I just have a simple last question for you because you both believe in political advocacy, and both of your unions have historically been involved in political advocacy. If the Ford government, if the Conservatives were turfed out of office in Ontario and replaced by one of the other parties, Do you think that things would change fundamentally or incrementally for unions and working people? I think the role for us as unions is, yes, to be politically active because you don't make change for people if you don't do it at the collective bargaining table and the political bargaining table. These two places, we have to be strong in in both arenas. But but the reality is, no matter who's there, even, you know, a worker-friendly NDP government like we have in BC right now, you constantly have to be vigilant because there are forces on the other side who will constantly be trying to push the government in a different direction. So we can never let our foot off the gas, no matter who's there. Our job is to constantly be pushing uh, for our members and for the best interests of them and for all working people. And I believe when we do that, we have a better and fairer and more equal country. Yeah, and the reason why I say both is because, I mean, Doug Ford's plans are failing. It's like drastically failing. Uh, and the reason why I say in- incrementally is because when we talk to him about the for-profit industry, and you know, we know that you can't do it overnight. So let's have the conversations and start to find solutions that, that could be. So I think it has to be both. And that's what we're about. Like, we just don't want to slam down the hammer and expect the impossible. We have our arms open to work with them. So I think, and I do believe that there are uh, politicians that think the same way. Hopeful. And I Hopeful. think, I mean, realistically, because we're in, you know, we've got public and private sector workers, as we discussed. I mean, the government has done a lot in the auto sector. This is this is true. They have worked, by the way, with the federal government. So the liberal government federally, uh, Ontario uh, conservative government work together to understand that we need it to invest in, in the auto sector uh, of the future. And they have been doing that. I think we're at 16 to $18 billion of new investment in the sector in a very short period of time. And, and that's critical too. It's, it's about finding the balance. And if you support working people over here, then you have to support them over here too. We need a strong public sector. We need strong public services in order to support all those workers that we want to also have in the private sector. It's about having a balanced economy and I think we can achieve it. Well, my my tricky question was a side door way of getting my own theory in here, which is that no party does really what you need and what working people need because they're all operating within the neoliberal paradigm still. And until you people crack that paradigm, 
you're not going to get fundamental change. Correct. Well, there's times when we were on the cusp of it. Uh, having said that, we have made a lot of progress in yeah. the last little bit. Uh, I would say particularly at the federal level, we are starting to move the ne needle on labor code. We are finally going to have anti-scab yeah. legislation in this country at the federal level in 2023. Uh, there's been a, a fair bit of movement. We finally have pay equity in the federal sector, uh, which means we're doing a lot of work at big employers tables like Bell Canada and uh, CN and CP and all of these folks operating in the federal jurisdiction. Uh, so things are moving, uh, but it does it does take a little time for all of that to filter out and make a difference for working people. You just got to keep going. There's no giving up here. <laughs> yeah. And we've seen some tremendous uh, improvements in home care. I mean, the wages over the last 10 years have completely doubled for those workers. Through our doubled? Work. What were they, 15,000? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. They were twelve fifty an hour. Yes. Yep. So thanks to, you know, good work right there. But I just want to say, too, though, David, you know what party I support 100 percent? What's that? That's the Purple Party. <laughs> the Purple Party. The Purple Party, yes. <laughs> That's the color of her union. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. <laughs> lovely, lovely Gandalf colors as well, I won't mention. But anyway. You two, thank you so much. What a great conversation. I think everybody who listens will have learned a lot from this. And, uh, you know, I love your passion and your realism, both of you. So thanks for come, taking the time to come on here. Charlene, always great to see you. Lana, you lovely too. to meet you. And, you uh, and uh, we'll, see you, we'll, see you both, we'll see you both again. In the meantime, I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our sponsors, CN Rail and Google. I'd like to thank everybody who watches or listens to this pod. I'd like to thank Lana and Charlene for being here. And uh, tune in next week for more, more Hurly Burly. See you then. Hurly Burly.